you know, it's getting so you don't even know whether where you should start being scared. You know, when you used to watch Frankenstein's monster, do any of you know the name of Frankenstein's monster? It was not Frankenstein. And uh, his name is not Suskind either. Do any of you know Frankenstein's monster, the name of the monster? It was one of my, he was one of my constant companions throughout, I'd say, a good seven years of my growing formative period there when I would wake up and he would be standing at the end of my, my sack just looking down at me with that half smile and coming out of the closet next to my ice skates and back of the place where I used to keep my galoshes would come this fantastic dwarf with a great big firebrand. Yeah, I'd wake up and look and, uh, <laughs> well, we got to be kind of old friends, but I never really knew what to call him. Because I'm quite a classicist, you know, very definitely a purist. And I knew that his name was not Frankenstein. It was Dr. Frankenstein who was in charge of making monsters. Contrary to popular opinion, the name of the monster was not Frankenstein. And so he would stand down there and smile. And he once in a while pick up my basketball. I had one of these rubber basketballs that I used in the backyard. And uh, he would pick up the basketball and kind of smile. And you see, he was a very, if you remember Frankenstein's monster, he was an extremely polite monster. He was not at all like these later rubber monsters that they have, like the thing from the, from the inner depths and all that, who are very aggressive monsters. They come out, you know, ah, they make these things with the claws and that. Whereas this was a very, very polite monster. And do you know that he and I shared the same bedroom? Because he'd stand on at the end of the sack for over seven years and never said anything because he was the kind of monster who would never be very forward and say something to you before you said something to him. Well, he would be standing down there and grinning with that lovely kind of monster grin he had, and this guy would come running out of the closet with the firebrand and screaming like mad, waving the, waving the firebrand in the monster's face, and I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what his name was or anything. I'm just a kid, you know. I'm very shy myself. So the two of us would stand there for a couple of seconds, and then this crummy little guy with the firebrand would chase him into the closet, and they'd go. For seven years, we never had a word to say to each other. He doesn't come back anymore. Does anyone remember his name? Uh, it's just another one of the great names, was like all of us, crying out loud. I, the other day, I went into my, my friendly bank, you know, where I got this friend, and the guy threw me out. I didn't have my number with me. And I said, look, the number represents me. I do not represent the number. And he said, I'm sorry, you do not have your number. And we cannot allow you to make a withdrawal unless you have your official withdrawal number. That is opposed to your deposit number, which is in gold. When you make the deposit, uh, you get a special gold star next to your name or your number. And I said, but I don't have my number with me. I'm sorry. I just want some money. I put it in here. He said, I'm sorry, Dad. So I don't know whether or not now whether we represent our number or it's the other way around. I can't tell. I suspect, however, that in the end the numbers will carry on long after we're gone. Did you hear about this thing that happened in England? Speaking of monsters, I got this thing here. Uh, uh, some reason or other, I am on the British Information Service thing, and I, I you know, they, they, all this propaganda about, you know, how they, the troops out in outer Afghanistan have now moved forward into the 20th century and are using rubber truncheons instead of those maces that they used to use and stuff. Well, I have, I have this thing. It says uh, from England, uh, they have a power substation. It recently broke down. Automated, of course, and automatically called in an automatic dialer to dial the telephone operator and release a pre recorded message which said, There is a fault at this power station. Please send repairman. There is a fault at this power station. Please send repairman. Well, from the other end, another automatic answering machine played back its recorded message. It said, You no longer dial O for operator. Please replace your receiver and dial 100. There is a fault at this power station. Please send repairman. Ooh, ooh. You are no longer dialing O for operator. Please replace receiver and dial 100. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Well, they, they don't know exactly how long this sparkling conversation went on between these two automatic machines. They figure that the message exchanged 
I, I, you don't know, how can you say changed hands, actually? Let us say that it, uh, it changed transistors. It went from one transistor bag to the other. They figure over 37,000 times, back and forth, back and forth. However, the interesting thing and the important thing to note is that no one did send the operator to repair it, and no one did dial 100. They just kept exchanging their messages back and forth back and forth. I suspect that when we're all gone, there will be messages still going on, still going on. My friendly bank will still be sending me deficit reports. My friendly bank will still be making deposits and taking them out. My number will go on marching forever and ever and ever. It is a wonderful thing to know, though. I wonder how many of you know that, that right now our government is preparing in its way and it's just not, don't, don't immediately think it's the candidate. It's just the world. Our government is preparing a universal number for each one of us. No, 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 this is an improvement over the old name. No, I'm sorry, you will get a universal number. Now, here's the beauty of the universal number. For the first time in all of history, man will now truly be unique. Now, we like to think that we will lose our individuality. No, oh, no. The beauty of the individual number is that it will never, ever again re be repeated. Whereas there can be 10,000 Gene Shepherds over history. What do you mean, so what? It's very important. So what? I, know, I have known in my time three George Washingtons. Now, two of them were phonies. There was only one real George Washington. And he was bugged about the other two. But nevertheless, the point is very important, well taken. You will have a number that will go on and 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 on forever. And 20 million years from now, there will never be another 714-228-6SJ7GTLDX Series B. That will be you forever and ever and ever. Oh, we're, we're improving things. I think that's a tremendous improvement, Gene Shepard. They don't even know how to spell it, for crying out loud. I'll, I'll guarantee you there isn't one out of seven of you can spell my name, and you've been listening for over, oh, probably ten minutes. Good, solid listen. No, you can't. You'll spell it with a G, I'm sure. No, I'm sorry. You'll spell it with an A-R-D. Oh, our IBM machine down on the traffic department has not once spelled my name right. It doesn't even spell IBM right. And it goes on and on and on. Now, they cannot misspell your number. It's impossible, because the minute they misspell your number, it isn't your number anymore. Forget it. We're improving things. Oh, really? I, I, I'm serious. I'm all for this. I'm for man chickening out every place he can chicken out. If we could get an automatic shepherd here to make automatic snide remarks every night, to make automatic witticisms and funny businesses, to, 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 to automatically guffaw and yell and holler, to automatically besiege the heavens and, and chant to the high, long spirits of the departed and the gone. By God, I'm all for it. The trouble is that I'm too ineffectual. A machine never misses. You see what I mean? There isn't a single one of us. I, I'll tell you what, what has scared the daylights out of me. I'm sorry, fellow. Would you move a little to the left or the right there? He's like a guy standing on the green, breathing heavily and wheezing. Uh, you know, uh, it's funny business. I, I just came back from Vermont, and I'm speaking to you now as a totally urbanized man. Uh, I went up to Vermont, and I, I spoke at this college way up in northern Vermont. In fact, it was a very spooky thing to turn on the television set in this uh, in this log cabin type motel, with the wind howling outside and the glaciers creeping up on you, and you can hear the polar bears snorting and growling. Oh, it was terrible! You got the natives spitting. It was it was something all up up there in Vermont. And and to turn on your television set and you get this flaky picture coming. You could see wind coming right across the right across the screen. You and everybody's got antennas up there that go up about 4,000 feet into the air to pick up what little signals they can get from the outside world. <sighs> and to sit up there and watch a show coming from Manhattan with all the hip Manhattan types, you know, the, the Tonight type show, you know, sitting around, ha, 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 and, and all the while I can hear, <clears throat> right outside my pad door, I can hear the glacier creeping slowly forward. <clears throat> 
and and old Johnny Carson or whatever his name is, yeah, well, isn't that his name? I think of that uh, that 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 current uh, mashed potato they got doing that show. Well, well, old Johnny Carson is sitting there making Johnny Carson. <laughs> well, that's very good, Chief. <laughs> and now, uh, Skitch, how about it? <laughs> and all the while, I hear. And once in a while, out in the back there, just beyond the garage where they put the 31 Essex Super 6s that they drive up there, I can hear. By God, it's a timber wolf. Do any of you remember, I'll award you a brass fig to with bronze oak leaf palm if you can tell me the name of the radio show that used to open up with the sound of a timber wolf. No, it was not Sergeant King of the Royal Mounted. He used to open up with a thing that would go... No, that was a very different one. Come on now, it used to open up like this... a gasser. No, it was not Sherlock Holmes. This show opened up with the sound of a timber wolf howling in the middle distance at 20 below zero. And there are few things that can chill the blood of an Ovaltine drinker quicker than the sound of a timber wolf in the middle distance, especially when you are living in the south side of Chicago and the only timber wolves you know carry pool cues and play snooker. Yeah. Do you know? Do you know that right now, up in, all right now, that's all right now. You sit back there. Speaking of wolves, this is W O R A M and F M, New York, and uh, the funny business about that, I I, I I brought back a message, so don't worry about it. I'm up in this college, see, and I I take the plane up to Boston. And I get off this plane. It's a real plane. You know the kind of planes they have at Idlewild, Carl? A real plane with the wings. And it's got motors and stuff. Well, you get off of the plane in Boston, and they say, where are you going? And you say, well, I'm going up in this place in Vermont. Vermont! And they put a parachute on your back. It's a very funny feeling to have them strap a parachute on your back, and they put one of these old brown suits with the high puttees on, and they strap it up. You, you, you rent it for a dollar and a half. Yeah. And you walk down to the under end of the field. You see, uh, they don't have airfields up there in Vermont. They have tarmacs. And uh, it's true. And I get up there, you see, and I get into this airplane, and I hadn't seen one of these airplanes, believe me, since I stopped reading G-8 and his battle aces, the kind of airplane they use to get up into the upper, upper corner of Vermont. See, because only four people go up there a month. And they save all the people like cordwood. Uh, in Boston, and when they get enough guys, which are seven, that fills this plane right up to the capacity, see, they get seven of them together, and they, they tramp them out uh, towards the far end of, of the big airport in Boston, where they have all the real planes. They take you down to the other end, you turn left, and you go through the woods. You go next to the water, and you climb up a hill, and there's this ancient tarmac there, and they have these planes, and you get out, well, they're not really airplanes. Well, they are airplanes, but the funny part of it is it takes a little while to get used to the sound of the rubber bands going out there. Yeah, and, and you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of interesting things about, about these airplanes. To begin with, we are used to getting into an airplane. Now, if you get into a 707 or you get into uh, a DC-7B or a Super Connie, uh, they're level. Well, the old air you forget that the old airplanes had a high landing gear in the front and a little wheel in the back. And, and so when you got into the airplane, it tilted straight up. It was like you were walking up a hill. Well, that was the kind of airplane. So we're already, we're already going up at a 45 degree angle and the plane hasn't left the ground. So we're all sitting in there and I thought, by George, it's just G8. And it was the first commercial airlines I have flown in. I have seen pictures of them where they give you a helmet with the goggles, you know. Yeah, you get a go the girl doesn't come around and give coffee. She comes around and gives you these goggles. And everybody straps themselves in and, and have big web belts. They have bucket seats. Oh, oh yeah. And they are totally, remember, they are totally, uh, they are totally not, uh, there is no such thing as a pressurized cabin. They don't go that high. These actually hedge hop. 
You see, they got a ceiling of about 75 feet, maybe, uh, with, with, a, with, that's with an updraft. So I get into this airplane, and these two guys come walking, striding out of the ready room. They do not have a, a, uh, an administration building in that part of the airport. is a ready room, you see, the tarmac. And these two guys had big white scarves around their neck. They had white long silk scarves, leather helmets, and one guy had one of these beautiful crip mustaches, you see, like G8 used to wear. And they had leather jackets zipped up sideways. And it was a funny thing. As they both came out, two of their buddies came out, Carl, out of the ready room and toasted them with glasses of cognac, which they hurled into a fireplace that they had in the ready room. And we're all looking out of the window of this airplane. See, it was a very interesting... Yeah, and, and, and one of them says to all our companions who have flown west, pow. Well, you know, I mean, it's very interesting. And I could see two guys back around the other side of the ready room. One guy was working on a Fokker D7. He was doing a valve job. And uh, I saw another guy who was working on a sop with camel. Yes, well, they were, of course, this was war surplus. They were, they were all cleaned up, and they were recovered, actually. They had new coat on them, and they were repainted. They had the airline na name on it there. It, was, it wasn't the old insignia, though. I missed that. But you could see where it was painted over. You could see it shining through. So we got into this airplane, and it was the first time in a long time that I have, of course, I've seen it in old movies with Dick Ireland and Dick Ferran. Richard Ireland, is it? And Dick Ferran, Chester Morris, you know, where, where this guy come out. Alan Hale came out. Yeah, well, Alan Hale came out. Alan Hale came out, and with Alan Hale was this other guy who looked a lot like Jimmy Cagney. And they spun the props, literally grabbed the hold of the props and spun them. And I could hear from up in the front, this guy hollers, Contact, Charlie! And these two grizzled mechanics, one of them, Alan Hale, and the other one had been hitting the bottle, looked a little like Pat O'Brien, or uh, Jimmy Cagney, they were both they were both swearing and hollering, and you could see it was a wonderful old group. One of them hollered up, and he says, "Give 'em hell, Chet! By God, it takes guts to go up in a crate like this." Well, I'm sitting there, you know. I paid my fare, and uh, we're we're waiting to go. And and these two guys, then it was, it was uh, you know, it's interesting to note that in some airports and some airlines, they still use chocks. Well, they had the chocks into this thing. And we're, you could just feel it. I could feel these, these, uh, these, uh, right. Uh, it's the first time I've, in a long time I've been in a plane that used right radial engines. And you could feel that torque going, you know, wow, 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 wow. And they're winding up, both going in opposite directions. And then, uh, our pilot, who, uh, I suspect had been influenced heavily by Chester Morris, hollered out, shocks! And with that, these two guys laying flat on the ground, yanked the chocks, and we went slewing down the mud of the tarmac. We were heavily loaded because we were going to make the long flight all the way nonstop to Mount Pelier. Ten thousand gallons of fuel overloaded. Will they make it? We could see the trees coming up on us. We could see those old high tension wires coming up, coming up, and down on the field. I could see Alan Hale looking up at us. And Alan Hale, you could just see that wonderful look in the eye from all those class B movies. Oh God, make it, Chet, make it, Chet. And the boss's daughter, who ran this little airlines, I could see was in love with the pilot who was operating our ship, and for, for crying out loud, it was Priscilla Lane. And she was down there, and she was on the phone. And the boss of the airlines was on the phone, too, and apparently they were talking to our pilot not to do it, to turn back. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, it was a thrilling moment, because uh, they did not have a wheel in this plane. I could see up through the front. They didn't have a door, you know. You could see the pilot sitting up in front there in the basket seats with the ropes all around, and they had a joystick. Well, this guy is pulling back on the joystick, and at the last moment, that wonderful old crate took off. Up we went. <laughs> Up we went. We have made it. Oh, we have made it. Up over the trees, and we can feel those, those evergreens brushing the bottom of those covered wings. Oh, 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 oh. And, you know, it's a funny thing how your instincts work. I'm an old G8 in the Battle Aces man from way back, Lone Eagle, the whole bit, you know. Instinctively, Carl, what do you think I did? I'm looking back into the sun to make sure that the dreaded checker nose circus 
isn't coming out of the sun once again. Gotta hear the rat a tat of those fantastic spandaus creeping up towards the cow, twisting into a beautiful chandel. No, I was waiting there. Well, you know, we 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 started a head chop. Now, remember, I've left I've left civilization, and I could see I could see it receding behind. And this great panorama began to unfold. Well, I'll tell you what it makes. Uh, it, it makes, well, it makes Labrador look like Disneyland. Uh, yes, it, it does. I'll tell you, it does. The snow is up there, and you can see the, and you can see the gray skies lowering. You know, and the ground was down there. It's, a, it's funny for all of you city people. You should see how real ground looks. And there, and there is no place, I can see why they issue us the shoots, there is no place that nothing bigger than a 14-inch wingspan rise-off-ground stick model can land without busting its thing, you know? Oh, yeah, it's wild. So we, we come along, and, and little did I realize, you see, when we were approaching the end, yeah, I'm in this plane, we are approaching the end of our trip. Well, here's the way it went. We are, we're, I, have not, I haven't seen this. I, the guy does... Believe me, it is. It is. Uh, have you seen those old movies where Jimmy Cagney lands the plane on the side of the mountain? You remember that? Always when they're in trouble, and he says, "We're going to go in," and and uh, Chester Morris is sitting next to him, and his jaw squares, and you can see Priscilla Lane in the back of the plane is crying. He says, "We're going to go in," and well, we are starting to go in. There is no airport visible on the ground. We are going right into the side of the mountain. Well, it is getting dark. And so this guy goes into this fantastic Immelman. Down goes one wing. And, and I could see those big right engines, that great big radial engine up there chopping and clawing away at that Vermont sky. And we're hanging on by our belts. Our guts are swimming up near our eyeballs. He is flying her now by the seat of his pants. And then we come clawing in and he stalls her in. He swings the tail end around. Show. We hit that gutty tarmac and slew sideways past two Stearman biplanes, past the Waco Cub. Arr! We swing up next to that great big Newport, that Newport Baby 28. Arr! And each one of us then snapped back our goggles. It's interesting, there was a Catholic priest sitting across from me. You ought to see how they look in their habit with the goggles on. Well, we snapped back our goggles. And it's, it's, of course, of course, men who have faced ultimate danger together have a certain bond. And all seven of us swaggered out of the plane. And two guys, well, actually five of us got off at this town, and two guys stayed on board. They were going on to the next outpost. Yes, it was true jungle hopping. It was, it was true bush piloting. They were going on to the next outpost. And I don't know whether you've ever gotten off a plane this way. We had to swing down off a rope. Uh, they lower a rope and you, you, you swing down. It's got knots on it. It's, they, it's very well. It, it's very effective. It works a lot better because you don't have to wait for those people. You know, pushing that thing up. You just swing down. You land in the mud, and you're, it is not really mud. This is tundra up there. It's uh, it's more. Yes, it is. It's tundra, and you can feel the permafrost under your feet. Your feet clatter as you walk across this mud. It's a funny thing. You you sink in it, and at the same time, it clatters. That's what permafrost is like. So we're walking across there wearing our high leather boots. Then we can see this little, this little galvanized iron, uh, this little, well, it's, it's, I guess it's a hanger. Uh, you have never seen, uh, you know, they don't have hangers out at Idlewild. They have, they have control centers and all that. But these are real hangers, you know, with the curved roof. And you can see a couple of old grizzled mechanics in there working on a, on a tri-motor, a Ford tri-motor, with kerosene lamps. And they have a genuine windsock. I'm telling you, a genuine white windsock up there. And it's the only weather instrument they've got. It tells them what direction not to take off into. And that wind, of course, there's only one direction you can take off at that airport. And it just is, it, all that windsock tells them is that their chances of getting killed have increased from 7 to 1 to 34 to 1. That's all. And so the wind is blowing. We, I can see we have made a downwind landing immediately. I know that much about airplanes. We, we, we've landed with the wind, but it didn't matter, you see. We're getting the mail through. 
And that was the wonderful thing. The Catholic priest took the bag of mail, which we had flown in from the big city. Yes, you know, these men go down, these, these pilots go down every night into the, into the jungles up there. And we took that bag of mail, and he threw it to a guy named Shorty, who was in the control room there. Shorty, Shorty was an... Uh, you've seen Shorty many times in these old movies. You remember Shorty? Uh, Shorty is the little guy that often plays gangsters. But, you know, it's a funny thing. Yeah, and, and when, when we came in, the Shorty's got the broken nose. And he says, hi, hi, Pop. Hi, Pop. He talks to the Padre, you see, his Pop. They've, they're old bu uh, buddies in arms. Of the, uh, apparently, the Padre flies on all flights. Uh, it's, a, it's a spiritual necessity, yes. That's right, he does. Uh, it's what kept us up. It wasn't those right p uh, engines. And, and so he says, hi, Pop, how was it? And the Pop just sort of shrugs, gives a little benediction, and throws him the, the bag of mail. And he says, thanks, Dad. He says, by God, you made it again. And, and we could see out in the lowering darkness there, our two pilots have, after belting down two more cognacs, have gotten into the cockpit of this, this, uh, this right engine operated plane, and they are taking off into the darkness. And it was a stirring sight now, you see, because now they're going into the wind. But the only thing is that they were going directly into a 7,000 foot bluff. And their, their plane was badly underloaded this time. Uh, five people had gotten off, so it had completely thrown off the whole, the whole structure, the whole center of gravity, and you should have seen it. I'm, I'm watching there, waiting for my bag to be released. They have a thing with the baggage there. The baggage is parachuted in earlier, because that has a special insurance on it that's higher rated than ours, and, and we're waiting for it to be brought in from the, for the forest out there. They have a jeep, and I'm waiting, and I could see this guy clawing his way into the wind. <laughs> Fantastic sight. Going up into the dark. <laughs> they had no lights on this airport at all. No lights. They had the kerosene lamp. And Shorty Cantlin is down there now. Shorty is the guy that plays the gangsters in the movie. Shorty is down there, and he's waving a kerosene lamp to show them the end of the runway. You see, and it's a, of course, this is a suicide mission, too. And because if the guy misses the end of the runway, it's Shorty has had it. And there was another Priscilla Lane there. Now, I don't know whether it was the same one that had come up by road or not, but she was there crying, watching him take off, and the, the manager of the airlines was this tough, hard guy. You know, this tough guy, Lee Tracy. And he was saying, hey, I'll get it up there. Don't worry about, don't worry about Dick. He'll get it up. And sure enough, Dick, clawing that thing right up into the sky. Oh! And I saw that, I saw that Falker trimotor lurch over the top of that mountain, clearing it by seven feet and down into the valley below. And we could hear the throb of those great engines crawling their way towards the Arctic Circle. Well, we, I, I, I waited a while there and uh, I took off my, my helmet, my goggles, and the, the, the transportation system then started up. I got into the transportation system, which consisted of an Essex Super 6 that was being driven by a heavy set native, a typical, as we call it in the trade, a typical laconic New Englander. Well, three of us got in the back seat of this car, and the man who was driving was up in front, and there was another passenger sitting up in front with him. Well, we spun through the night air. You, if you think, I'll tell you, if you think it gets dark ever in New York, forget it. It was only 7 o'clock up there, and it was darker than the inside of my tennis shoes at 3 o'clock in the morning in the back row of my stuff in the closet. It was black. And once in a while, you could see way up there, the mountains are leering down. You can see a little tiny flickering, just a little yellow light of a candle in the window of some hardy settler up there. And we are spinning through the night. And once in a while, a little flicker of light. Maybe it was the terrible, terrible lurching angels of the northern lights. I don't know. A little light would flicker the sky. And you could see the outlines of the mountain. And we're spinning along. We're in America. It is America. And the only sound is the occasional sound of the laconic New Englanders spitting out the window. On that, on that corduroy road that we're bumping over. <laughs> you know what a corduroy road is? Logs laid end to end. <laughs> Not a word is spoken among the hardy travelers who had braved the rigors of death, who had looked the great stone face right in the eye and had come through. <laughs> 
we are boring ever onward, ever northward. And then once in a while you could hear uh, that long, black, stygian darkness of the American night. Ooh, ooh, ooh. The sound of a timber wolf coming down from way up on the upper slope somewhere. Ooh, 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 ooh. And then, by George, we arrived at the oasis. A hot dog stand, shaped in the shape of a covered wagon, manned by girls wearing high black and white leatherette boots, big sombreros, and the thing was called the Dilly Wagon. Welcome, eat, come in. Our natives spit twice. You want a hamburger? Yeah. We stopped for a hamburger, and I knew I was home. I was back with Mother Earth. I was back in America. My home. My home. <laughs> and you think I'm inventing all this? Well, take a trip sometime to Montpelier, Vermont. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. It's a... Uh, it's, uh, it's a funny thing, uh, and I felt all along, you know, you, you have a tendency to feel afraid of New York. People are afraid of the great urbanization. Well, we are so urbanized, you and me and all the rest of us, that just the sight of a mountain in the darkness and the sound of a timber wolf wailing into the wind will scare you 50 times worse than anything BBD and all could cook up in a thousand years. I can speak of BBD and I'll hit him again. Come on, while Question. I'm moving. <laughs> what fine car, introduced last fall at the Paris Automobile Show, is often thought to cost over $1,000 more than it does? Answer, the Riviera by Buick. But then this is quite understandable. For when you first see the low, classic lines of the Riviera, when you investigate its interior luxury and then actually experience the excitement of driving this fine car, it's only natural to expect it to be priced within the reach of only a very few. That's why, if you decide to come in and see the Riviera at your nearby Buick dealers, you're in for a happy surprise. For while the Riviera does cost more than a conventional car, it's priced far lower than you'd expect. Come in and see for yourself. Come in now during your Buick dealer's trading powwow. See the magnificent new Riviera by Buick. He's one of the new oleo men. Carved out of solid... Uh, a taste just like the... Just like the expensive spread. The old-fashioned expensive spread. <laughs> While we're on the subject of... Uh, of uh, oleo, I would like to tell you... Uh, about the limelight. Uh, they're one of our new sponsors, but it's uh, kind of embarrassing. It's like talking about somebody you've known for a thousand years. But the limelight is, to my way of thinking, one of the most pleasant places in all of New York. Uh, it's down in the village. It's at 91 7th Avenue South, right in the heart of Sheridan Square. And it's, uh, I don't know what it is. It's not a coffee shop. It's not a restaurant. It's not a bar. It's all of those things, and yet it's not one of those things. It's a place. And it's open seven days a week. And if you really want to experience New York, uh, or at least one phase of New York, that is absolutely authentic, uh, that's, that's real and genuine, I would suggest you drop into the limelight for dinner some night before, or maybe after, I'd say after the tourists go uptown to make the theater scene. Come after 8.30, and particularly after midnight. That's when it really moves, between midnight and 2 o'clock in the morning. This is the limelight. Oh, by the way, Kelsey Marischal, who runs the limelight, says that uh, he's collecting heads to hang on the wall down there. And he says, if you've got a head, you want to hang on the wall, bring it down. But it has to be stuffed. Uh, that is the only, <laughs> that's the only house rule. Outside of that, they don't care what kind of head it is as long as it's stuffed. <laughs> I could see somebody bringing down genuine 17-year-old New Jersey girl bag July 14th, 19th. <laughs> well, I would say this is the limelight, and it makes it that. really does. It genuinely does. I would not kid you to quote a confrere. Uh, it's real. 
And while we're on the subject, what's this fashion ET anyway? You got an ET that says fashion ET? Huh? What is the fashion ET? Well, let's not do it then. Let's uh, let's let's just forget about it because we don't have. There it is. Plug it into the thing there, and you're going to get what what's called the fashion ET. You know, while we're on the subject of automation, the the note that came out of England about these two machines talking back and forth to each other for like 27 straight hours. The important thing to remember is that they never lost their temper. Now, that is a genuine contribution, except that I think the thing about man that makes him great is that he does lose his temper. That there is a point beyond which you cannot push even the simplest slob, and he will start throwing stuff, which is the only thing really in, this, in the end that will really civilize us. I think contrary-wise to what many people think, that uh, that there is, the, let's say there is a threshold of buggedness that operates. Now, it has gone up pretty high. I say that, that it's almost out of sight now. People will take almost anything without getting bugged. For example, for crying out loud. Hello, I'm Tony Marvin, here to tell you about one of the most exciting wow. television programs of the season. Boy, talk about it's butter, the man. USA Spring 63. Well, he's more of the real old-fashioned spread. He's not the old the hotel. This is the real stuff. The Fashions USA is a special oh, yeah. television showing of fashions from the collections That's of true. America's Each leading Each word designers. comes out wearing Argyle there, socks. I'll charming company of one of our most glamorous Look at that, and a tweed jacket. Lovely Mary Ann Mobley. That's it. Now, first, we'll take you back to the... Each word has a... you'll meet some of the world's top beautiful? fashion Listen models. That. And Each word has a bow tie on it. Create the styles you'll be wearing this season. Oh, for and then the it's show. coming out of one of those Featuring tubes, you know, that they decorate cakes with. Famous designers as old Rosettes and little things. Abby Carnegie, <laughs> Larry Aldrich, Bobby Barron, Ben Reed, <laughs> Maurice Rentner, wow. Anna Troy, and That's many, great. many others. It's a dazzling display of Wonderful. women's and children's fashions by America's couturiers. We're all I know you oh, do say that word again. Can you do that one over again? Couturiers. 90 minutes of sheer beauty. Sunday night at 9. Essence of Charlton on Heston. WOR-TV, Channel 9. Yes. Gee, somebody, uh, somebody, uh, who was it who said the terrible thing about Charlton Heston? Could very Hello, well. uh, I'm Tony Oh, Mark. cut it out. Oh, about yeah. one of the most exciting All right, go ahead, all the way. Let's Season. go. Oh, the Tony. Fashion, uh, USA, uh, Spring right. 63. Yeah, you give the these guys automation. If we didn't have that darn machine in there, it would have taken them 20 minutes to requeue it. But the new machine can inflict infinite torture endlessly at no pain to the torturer. Watch him. Now. Glamorous, Miss America. See, all he's got to do is press it. Look at it. Look at that Mobile. fat face in there laughing. We'll take you back that rotten engineer. Do you, pa- do you people know out there that the, the engineer's got a fantastic delight in throwing this stuff out at you? Look at him. The and best moment the of the show for Eddie. Look at that. the newest collections look at that look. of such famous designers Insane. as Oleg Cassini, the Chinese Abby water Carnegie, torture. Larry Aldrich, he drops Bobby one Barron, commercial ben on your head every Maurice, 30 seconds. Retina, and at the end of five and years, you're on your skull. Others. It's a dazzling right, display come on, of women and children's come on, fashion come on, cut it out. by America's couturier. <laughs> Greg, I know you won't Greg. have to miss the fashion <laughs> USA. No, I can't take it anymore. Stop, Tony. Sunday night at 5 on WOR TV channel. Please, please don't. Please, let me go, will you? Just give me one chance, all of you. Just get off my back, will you? I mean, you know, fellas, come on, cut it out. I'd love to sell everything. I'd like to get all that stuff moving off the shelves, all of it. I want to get those Buicks moving, and I want to get the line like going. I want to get everything going, but I know, I know I can't. I want to sell it all. I want to. Oh, fellas, where can I sign up? You know, I'd love to sign up. I got this letter from this kid the other day, and he says, "Shepherd, don't sell out." What do you mean, kid? I've been trying to sell out for years. I just can't find out where they line up to fill out the forms. <laughs> Somehow, you know, that, that, that reminds me of Saturday night in Milan, Indiana. Uh, did I ever tell you about the time? I, I, I shouldn't tell you this. I know it's an awful thing. About the time when I was this kid and I'm playing the bass. I played the E-flat upright. I also played the B-flat four valve sousaphone. Oh, yes. I also worked a little bit on the string bass and occasionally would double on the timpani. Oh, <laughs> I've been there. Well... <laughs> All right. I have been there, whether you like it or not. Look at that. Look at that finger. That finger is one, <laughs> one solid bit of gristle 
And look at that. It's a callus that goes all the way up to my elbow from that rotten <laughs> aluminum base. Get it out. Well, anyway, Eddie, I'm going to tell you about a, one of the wildest Saturday nights that I ever spent. I got a call from a friend of mine, and he said, Are you doing anything? And he was a musician friend of mine who played the trombone. <coughs> he said, You doing anything? I said, No. I'm a kid. I'm about 17 years old, and it's springtime, and it's warm. He says, You doing anything tonight? I said, No. He says, Hey, you got your bass home from school? Yeah. I had my E-flat upright in the closet. And once in a while, I, when I felt particularly rotten, I would take it out and practice Semper Fidelis just to get on my old man's nerves, you know, and and uh, everybody else in the neighborhood. So he says, you got your bass? And I said, yeah. He says, well, listen, I, I'm sitting in with this outfit, with this, with this, yeah, I'm sitting in with this band. He said, why don't you come down to the house? Well, he knew that if he had told me what he was sitting in with, I wouldn't have shown well, I get my sousaphone, my, or rather my E-flat upright, with the strap, and I go down to his pad. We pick up his trombone, and we go downtown to where he's going to sit in. Well, he was sitting in with an outfit that was doing a series of sidewalk concerts on behalf of a mission for indigent bums. And they were also doing something on behalf of, I think, the original book of Genesis. And they passed out hymns to us. Well, my friend is blowing the, blowing the trombone, I am blowing the E-flat, and they give us hats to wear. Well, we started out with Rock of Ages. The next thing that we played was uh, bringing in the sheaves. Well, I start going, and, and I, I, I just can't help it, i got to play melody. Actually, the E-flat the, the e upright uh, part in bringing in the sheaves is bom, 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 bom. Bom, 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 is the way it goes. But I am out there blowing solo. Bom, 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 Well, I am blowing, bringing in the sheaves. And the director of this outfit has a hat, and there are people standing around throwing quarters on the drum. And the guy keeps looking back at me because he knows I'm not playing the music. And, and, and that's a very peculiar problem here. But yet I was playing it with, with all the zeal that a 17-year-old kid can get into bring, playing, bringing in the sheaves on an E-flat upright. I am blowing my skull right out of my eyeballs. And it's the first, because I never played, I never got a chance to play melody. My friend is there blowing away on a counterpoint with wah, 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 bring on in the sheaves. It was the biggest night this outfit ever had. They grossed over $7 that night, which was the biggest night they had since the big flood. WOR Radio, your station for news.